Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Clueless Safe Trading Frank. This is a free uh, market update webinar. Sorry about missing it last night. Had a couple of things to do, take care of. Um, we have uh, a bunch of members here. We have uh, Xeta, we have uh, Golf, we have Paul, we have Reed, and we have uh, Ripping Pants. So let's kick off. It's February 13th, day before Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's to all of you. It's um, Monday, February 13, 2017, approximately uh, 8, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Full disclosure, this is purely for financial education and not for any solicitation or advice. And tonight's topic is basically what, what's on everyone's mind, is where the heck is this market going? And uh, when can we expect some sort of moderate correction or retracement, as we call it? and um, what we can expect uh, for the remainder of uh, this month, the second half of this month. So it's really as simple as that. So like I always do, a uh, couple of uh, uh, important comments uh, on, uh, on what's going on. Um, this is the, uh, what's happening with the markets uh, right now is not something uh, abnormal. Uh, it is not something that hasn't happened before. And it's a mirror opposite of what happens when markets sell off, uh, where we keep on asking ourselves the question, where's the bottom? And, uh, and in this case, we are asking ourselves the question, where is the top? So it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, human psychology dictates that, uh, uh, that when markets are falling rapidly, um, and uh, despite uh, internal technical signals that are flashing um, a bottoming process and all kinds of... Uh, uh, deep oversold conditions. This is an exact opposite of that where we have severe overbought conditions overall uh, across the board, but the markets um, uh, just will are relentless. Uh, and uh, that is the nature of the beast. Uh, the, uh, the simple reason behind that, which I want everyone to appreciate and understand, which I've always talked about for years now, is that these markets are driven completely by algorithmic high frequency trading machines what we call black boxes. And black boxes have a certain level uh, that they want to uh, that they want to get to. And in the process, they basically bulldoze over institutional shorts. And that's exactly what's happening right now. I've uh, spoken to some of my old peers uh, back in the hallowed canyons of Wall Street. And uh, believe it or not, they are completely uh, lost uh, uh, as to what's going on. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, hedge funds, uh, which have committed uh, shorts, which were in place um, up to around the 2280, 2300 level uh, on the S&P 500. And, uh, and once the, the market basically crossed over with a burst, what we call a breath thrust, um, uh, where uh, the markets move uh, consecutively 100, 200 points a day uh, and, and, uh, and clear the gravitational force of the downward pull, uh, which would be considered to be normal, uh, a downward pull meaning a reset or a retracement of, uh, of any big move. Uh, well, that breadth thrust is basically what we are seeing in progress right now. It's really quite simple. However, uh, when you have a what the average retail trader calls and the media calls a runaway train, it is actually not a runaway train. It is very, very methodical what's going on. And we are going to try to decipher and through technical charts, look to see um, where we can move up to and also revisit some of the points that I'd, um, levels that I'd shown weeks and weeks ago. And, uh, and, and that, those are the levels that the market is basically getting to. And I will admit they're getting to there in a much faster fashion, uh, uh, speed than even myself as, a, as, as somebody who's been primarily bullish um, and I'm still bullish um, it, it, it did not uh, expect so that's just the way things are so what happens in these type of environments is uh, that uh, the average trader uh, who uh, does not really understand the power of momentum um, or a very, or in the same vein, a very disciplined technical trader who does understand the power of momentum, both fall in the same boat. Now, what do I mean by saying that? What I mean by saying that is that both are stuck. In other words, 
the discipline of not chasing and buying into overbought levels uh, and the on the other end of the scale uh, the, the the fearful trader who basically missed out on the on the big moves on the tactical lows um, now thinks the market is way too high they're both stuck in the mud now this has this is happening and and, and mix that in with the institutional shorts uh, who are at this point uh, their stops on the upside are being triggered um, and uh, on the short side and uh, that's pushing this 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 uh, uh, waves of of buying um, a good question was asked by uh, our uh, very loyal member golf uh, as to where is this new money coming from I thought that was a fantastic question well the new money is coming from different sources there are pension funds who are under invested who never bothered looking at a, at a Tesla when it was at 190 200 220 dollars when we were we're very excited about it uh, and uh, in in our group uh, in 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 showing all the technical charts that it was a, a that the stock would ramp higher and are right now entering the stock or getting squeezed uh, uh, forced to enter the stock that's other name for a squeeze or short squeeze um, at 280 and uh, 270 so so basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a very funny situation where two ends of the investing spectrum, both the institutions and the retail uh, uh, trader, uh, active retail trader, I should say. And keep in mind, retail traders come in all sizes and shapes, right? There are some retail traders who are uh, just uh, trading very large sums of money, and there are uh, retail traders who are trading small sums of money. Um, that uh, both, these, uh, uh, both these different sides of the coin, uh, the so-called smart money, who is who really are not smart money to be honest with you dumb money and the retail trader who's considered to be somewhat dumb money uh, is uh, are both uh, stuck in the same room uh, with the doors closed and that's really what's going on here okay that's really what's going on here so without trying to be uh, uh, emotionally defunct and 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 just sit on the sidelines and and uh, and do nothing uh, what we have been doing here at Clueless Safe Trading, uh, as you very well know, is we've been selective on uh, on stocks uh, that are being suggested uh, and then doing extremely well. Uh, case in point, stocks like Biogen, sp uh, stocks like Regeneron, uh, stocks like Allegan, um, uh, swing uh, trades uh, like uh, ACIA, uh, Twilio, um, uh, very uh, uh, powerful uptrending stocks, which are not big movers every day, but slowly keeps them creeping higher, like pa uh, Palo Alto Networks. Um, and then we have the momentum plays, uh, such as Amazon, Apple, Tesla, Google, Priceline, uh, which was recommended around the 1560, 70 level, uh, and uh, and 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 uh, with uh, with Lotto's being uh, suggested at 1610, 1620, and the stocks at 1646. So. Uh, and then we have our uh, uh, other section, uh, which are basically the smaller plays, special situations like Macy's, um, and then we have situations like uh, Hershey, HSY. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dry Ships, uh, which is currently up after hours, uh, 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 a good solid 15% or so. Um, I uh, actually uh, didn't get a chance to post. Uh, I did notice it on my radar, uh, uh, Sino. Uh, which is another dry bulk shipper, uh, which is up 96% right now uh, after the after hours move. That's Sino Global, uh, S I N O. Um, so those are the special situations, you know, uh, that uh, that we also play. Uh, just showing you the segments of the different trading type of stocks that we trade here at uh, Clueless Day Trading. Then we have uh, the pure clean plays, uh, if one might call that, in the form of playing the SPX, uh, the SPIs, the IWM the Russell 2000 and those have been tracking the market obviously they are the market and uh, those have been doing tremendously well including uh, including um, the Russell 2000 which is about to breach 1400 so bottom line is that um, despite the caution that's generated by the technical signals the market has a mind of its own and can remain can remain overbought over an extended period of time so in this type of scenario any type of minor retrace and I mean minor are immediately bought because the shorts which are 
uh, or the institutional shorts who have been literally um, what do you call decimated are uh, immediately uh, try to take advantage of that and cover their remaining you know short positions um, looking at the other side of the coin uh, if you look at the other proxies like the VIX uh, the TVIX uh, things of that sort the RVX which is the Russell 2000 VIX uh, they are trading um, close to not quite given where the markets are they should be trading at the lows we'll look at that tonight they should be trading uh, the VIX should be trading at historical lows of between uh, 9 and 10 but it seems to be stuck around 11 because there is protection being bought across the board knowing very well that the pullback is coming there will be higher the market goes from these levels the larger the pullback will be that's just the nature of the beast every action has an equal and opposite reaction and that is what we're going to basically try to look at and try to figure out every action has an equal and opposite reaction it doesn't mean we need to have a 1500 point drop on the Dow but it does mean that gaps will be filled and and the markets will then at that point regenerate kinetic power what we call coil springs okay and then move forward so let's take a look at a simple so so that's basically what my you know overall uh, um, thesis is the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, before we get into the charts is if you look at the news stories over the weekend right under under a normal circumstance if the market was fearful and not being generated by these reasons that I just explained generating higher uh, um, uh, the power generating higher um, the seasonal factors included also um, uh, we would have corrected um, at least uh, 200 points no question about it there was a North Korea ballistic nuclear test which was very serious okay um, we had uh, issues with uh, uh, political issues which are not necessarily very favorable um, to the administration uh, we had uh, uh, we had warnings uh, from the Fed Vice Chairman uh, Stanley Fisher all these were tweeted out so people to have a overall knowledge of what's going on um, under normal circumstances they be considered pretty severe um, but uh, as you can see the market shrugged that away and just propelled forward so those things like they say um, news uh, good news bad news in a or slightly negative news on a uh, bull market is moved away till it catches up to it just the opposite of where good news in a downtrending market when we were falling 500 600 700 800 points over a month or two uh, good news is shoved away it's the same thing that happens on the opposite side so as market historians and we all have to be somewhat of market historians so we understand the the nature the characteristics of markets um, financial markets I have to say that everyone should be aware of these things it's a uh, markets are manic depressive uh, they are seldom uh, neutral uh, just like human beings the human beings are either happy or they're sad uh, they're seldom you know they're seldom calm uh, some are uh, but uh, uh, but most aren't you know we are driven by emotions and so uh, right now is sort of the manic phase of the market what we call wave five which I've shown a few times on my charts. That's an Elliott wave theory thing, and I'm not an expert on it, but I do understand the concept of it. So we're in this wave five, and the wave five generally is uh, equal to wave one, and that wave one was the uh, was the uh, powerful rally, and we can uh, certainly take a look at that uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, that was generated from November 9th up to uh, uh, till till about a month or so, when we gained about 1,200 points. All right, so that's so wave one equals wave five. So if this is wave five, then we have a little bit more to go. And I showed that on the Dow Jones Industrial Chart earlier on. I want everyone to basically focus and take a look at it and put some precise numbers on it. And I'm sure that many of you did see it. And the numbers that were put out there was a price target one of 20,598, uh, which is a very high probability move. Uh, and the price target two, which is 21,000, which is a low probability move, which could come after we retrace and then generate more energy to move forward. Okay, and those are shown on the charts, not me making up the numbers. So saying all that, let's take a short term view here. 
of um, the S&P 500. So here's an S&P 500. It's a very clean channel. Uh, from the low, uh, from the lows uh, at this point, we call it the lows, 2285. We were calling it the highs just, uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, if you remember. Um, and uh, and that's the that sort of the acceleration point. You can see that uh, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, you can see the date up here. Um, it's uh, uh, Wednesday, the 8th of February. Uh, today is uh, the 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 thir uh, thirteenth. Uh, so just a couple of days. You're talking one, two, three, three days. So in a three-day channel, it looks like it's months, right? Uh, but this is a three-day channel, three trading day channel from last Wednesday. Uh, and uh, two, three, yeah, three days going into the fourth day tomorrow. So bottom line is that if you look at this channel, you can clearly see here uh, that we have two lines. Uh, one is the the the, uh, the uptrending channel. The upper end of that channel is somewhere around 2338, 2340, something that I talked about I think about a month ago or two months ago that we would get to about 2340. I really did not expect it to happen this fast, but hey, that's the market. So then we have a uh, 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 then we have a, uh, a, a rising wedge type of situation. And the way the rising wedge is is this is the upper end of the wedge, and this uh, if I change the color, uh, you'll see that this is the lower end of the wedge. Bear with me. Bingo. So there's your rising wedge there that you're looking at. Now, rising wedge, 100% of the time, uh, uh, they uh, they they uh, get to the top of the wedge and then they pull back. Just that's it, you know. And and, and if it's going to stay within the wedge, then this is what's going to happen. You're going to basically move from here. You're going to move up towards uh, the 2235 level or so. Uh, and then you're going to pull back and test the 2330 again. And keep in mind, as the rising wedge continues to move forward, it gets narrower and narrower. It's also known as the diagonal. So it goes like this, right? So it gets narrower and narrower, and then it uh, and then it tends to correct. So where is the first level of correction? The first level of correction directly that comes in front of our eyes is basically the first gap. And that gap is somewhere between 2320 and 23. Uh, 2315 to 2320 and this gap will get filled no question about it this gap might very well get filled by mid-month uh, and it happens to coincide with um, Janet Yellen's testimony uh, in front of Congress and the Senate which is um, tomorrow and the day after so it happened could happen by Wednesday so if we get up here towards the 2335 23 uh, uh, somewhere around this level uh, uh, and uh, somewhere between 2335 and 2340 um, Let's say we we break above that uh, and get to the upper end of the channel. Remember, this is a channel, um, and, uh, and then at that point, you could get a abrupt, uh, quick sell-off based on nothing but some comments that she makes. Okay, she could be a little bit more hawkish. She could be very dovish. Both can be interpreted negatively by the market. If she's too hawkish, as in that she start to raise rates uh, strongly uh, starting in March, which is just around the corner. Markets are going to take that somewhat negatively, believe me when I tell you. That means that they're speeding up the pace of rate hikes. And even though markets like higher rates, they don't like the speed of that rate hike. They're going to try to read into it. Um, or she might be very dovish and say that uh, she still sees a lot of slack in the economy and that she's going to sit back and uh, not raise rates, you know, or hint towards that. The markets are not going to like that either. So that means that there's some underlying weakness we're not seeing, and uh, the, and the banks and the financials uh, will not benefit uh, from this prolonged um, weak rates. So both can be looked on as uh, both can be looked on as uh, as as negative, or the markets might decide that everything is positive, uh, that uh, a, a a delayed rate hike might be um, might be good. And uh, you know, keeps on uh, keeps uh, keeps uh, juicing up uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 pool of money that's out there uh, without having to drain it. So in that case, they might take it positively, and who knows, we might break out over this channel, which would be uh, pretty wild, and it could happen. I'll tell you that. So. And remember, we're not the only ones driving this market. There's foreign money in here. Uh, there are global markets which are doing extremely well. In fact, I was uh, listening to a comment that we are uh, we are actually lagging the global markets in their uh, on their uh, uh, year-to-date returns and the one-year returns. So that's pretty wild. So if we're going to play catch-up with some major global markets out there, um, 
then um, I'll tell you, you know, we have more room to go. So whichever the case, the first gap is going to be your first level of uh, of, of a reset. And that drop uh, would be roughly about uh, 20 points, you know, 20, 20 points or so. So that's 20 points means it's roughly about 100 to 120 points on the Dow. Big deal. We're at 20,412. Just a couple of days ago, we're at 20,000 plus. And uh, so a 100 point drop or 150 point drop is not going to end the world. Um, so that would be, uh, uh, one needs to be prepared for that. The next level of gap, uh, purely looking at the gap fill uh, 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 strategy, is uh, in the twenty in the 2305 and 2310 level. And my other chart that I put out there, I put the boxes on the gaps, and it's very, very clear what I showed. So that would be it. There is a one further gap down here at the 2295 level, but the, the way we have moved up so fast, so furious, uh, Unless we have a sharp pullback, this would be considered a sharp pullback in that 2295 level. Um, that's uh, uh, that could be a um, that that's the third possibility for a sharp pullback, uh, which means that we would be losing approximately um, 35, 540, 40 points. So that's roughly about a 240 point move on the Dow if we do ha do get one of this. Now on a 15 minute chart, obviously it looks pretty dramatic, but let's scroll out to the daily to understand what's going on here. So that's clear about the short term view about what we are looking at. So let's take a look at uh, the daily. Let's take a look at the one hour, for example. So you look at the one hour chart, and uh, this is something that everyone should be, you know, uh, everyone should be looking at. Uh, and on the S&P, uh, which is obviously not as dynamic as the, as, as the E-minis, um, let's take a look at what the, what the zone was where we broke out of. Well, this was the wide trading range. This was the narrow trading range, and this was the wide trading range. So the wide trading range was 2300, okay, 2301, and the low end was 2357. So that's 60, uh, that's 63, uh, Sorry, that's 43 points from here to there. From here to here is 43 S&P points. And this is sort of back of the napkin type of quick calculations. That's 43 point band and we jettison forward and that is what a breadth thrust looks like. That's when the shuttle takes off, booster rockets and all. And uh, here's Mother Earth, okay, and, uh, and, and you just left it. You're in the you're in the gravity of an orbit right now. You're heading towards the gravity. You know you've left that gravitational field of Earth. That's what's known as a breadth thrust. You need force. Markets are physics after all, and you know you need force to get out of there. And this is this is the force that we are seeing. Energy. So 43 points here. So if you add the uh, and, and if you look at it as uh, as uh, uh, the the trading range breakout, then uh, simple. Uh, back of the napkin calculation is you add 43 points on top of the move here. So if you move 43 points on top of the move here, uh, you are basically arriving at 2343, which matches pretty much with what we just talked about on the shorter term charts. So let's look to see what uh, this one projects out to. So this one projects out to 2340. So without quibbling over two or three S&P points, a maximum move and an intelligent guesstimate or estimate of how fast the markets can move over this short period of time, maybe even this week or maybe the month of February, is that we got uh, we have another uh, we closed at 2328, so we got another 15 points left underneath the belt. So 15 points is basically 100 points, right? About 100 points on the Dow. That means we get to 20,500. Keep in mind about one thing about the markets, which you all know better than I do. Markets love round numbers. Stocks like love round numbers. So 23,400, 20,400, 20,500. So 20,500 is where we get to if we get to it's this point here. And an overshoot would be 2350. So that's sort of the quick way of looking at it as to what what uh, uh, what uh, is uh, uh, projections are on the S and P five hundred on and on the Dow twenty thousand five hundred um, maybe oh, and a little overshoot. There's always overshoots and uh, and 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 another 
and and for a 43 point move from the breakout level not from today from the breakout level so that's you know it's pretty clean uh what what what, I, what i'm seeing here uh i draw i i drew the channels upper end of the well the far end of the channel is 2350 uh 2340 is the lower end of this channel and then the breakout here is uh bear with me one second the rising wedge and if we break out of the rising wedge which we have repeatedly done so lately uh then we are looking at breaking out over 2335 that's just around the corner that's roughly about another 40 points or so 40 to 50 points on the dow before we break out of this of this uh, uh um, bust a move out of this rising wedge and then we hit some major resistance at this uh, at this steep steep what i call acceleration channel that we are traveling in let's switch the studies here a little bit and try to get a little bit deeper into the into the um internals this is the quick sort of trading chart with the dmi which is the dynamic momentum index um is uh is 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 sort of you know again they're all connected together because the core is the relative strength index over overbought oversold condition type of thing the dynamic momentum in this dmi is simply another derivative of the relative strength index so let's get the studies let's get some yellow dots out of here Let's use a good old Darvis. This gets a little bit deeper into the heart of the matter. Okay, so we'll go one by one and uh, try to read the tea leaves. So let's move. So we, we keep, we're keeping the structure on top of it, the, 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 the acceleration channel and all that stuff. And look to see what we're seeing with the Darvis. Now the Darvis, uh, the Darvis is clearly, the, the blue lines are, the curvy blue lines are your Bollinger Bands. And, uh, and, and here we are with, uh, with our moving averages. Uh, and we're going to talk about standard deviation because at extreme points in the market, where markets are completely melting or markets are, 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 are ramping big time like now, we have to look to see the standard deviation or the distance traveled from what the moving averages are, where the markets will always revert back to. We might not know the exact time of the day, but they will revert back to the moving averages. No question about it. That's why I always leave Prouder dry, because when that quick, fast pullback comes, hopefully it comes during during trading hours, or else only guys like Reed are going to make money because they're they're futures traders. Um, just getting rid, but uh, you know, you, you're you being an e-mini trader, uh, you guys can take advantage of overnight actions. We can't. Um, the bottom line is uh, that uh, if it happens during market hours, you're going to get a big bang for your buck um, on the on the, on the short side by using uh, you know all kinds of instruments, by using SPX puts, by using RUT puts, by buying the uh, uh, UVXY, uh, or buying any of the ETFs on the on the short side. Uh, I believe the SPXS is the short ETF, uh, which is trading at a measly nine dollars and fifty-six cents, uh, with a year high of twenty-two thirty-one. So if you look to you say, hey, listen, maybe nine. That's the SPXX, SPXS, not the. Uh, 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 so basically, um, uh, so so basically, um, you can use that as a hedge. Or any one of anything that you know that that you that you're familiar with. So what we see here is this is what I see. We have a very pinched Darvis here, very pinched Darvis. Okay, you can see that. That's a bottleneck. You don't see that too often. You don't see that too often at all. These were wide Darvis boxes. This was the time of uh, uh, big volatility before we started to break out. This happened very fast, very quick last Tuesday, and then of course you know just when it moved up like that. Uh, there was, uh, it, it was just, uh, and then of course today it pulled it higher. So we have a serious bottleneck here. Upper end of the bottleneck, if you want to be exact, is 2331 on the S&P, and the lower end of the bottleneck is 2327. That is historically one of the tightest trading ranges 
seen and you've seen a lot of articles and uh, you've seen a lot of media talking about it too um and then let's let's take a look to see the internals on the internal side basically um uh, the on on the fair stochastics uh, the market's basically trying to hold of you know uh, over 80 uh, it closed at 79.06, uh, but staying over 80, this is what you call extended overbought conditions. We got extended overbought once we crossed over 80 last Wednesday, okay, last Wednesday. And that extended overbought condition um, failed to materialize in any type of resets or retracements like we're used to and stayed overbought and uh, today had a minor dip. Uh, starting around noontime and then the you know and and then in the afternoon very minor no one even felt it all right no one felt it no one saw it on the big cap stocks that moved the markets you know it's just in the pennies on those stocks and uh, that that they pull back so this is still con this is still um very um you know very much in overbought condition uh, and it's still staying above so let's try to look for a comparison uh, which we always have to do as chartists we look to see what happened the last time well the last time we had this type of move which we actually haven't we have seen a sharp move we saw one here um, which uh, I did call uh, uh, correctly uh, back on Monday, uh, 23rd of January. You can see that right there. And then we had a very sharp move. Let me get my uh, little highlighter. Bang, right? So that caused a big, fast move up. Similar thing, the Darva shot up, created a bottleneck that, the, that it traded in for a day or two. Uh, and then the following Monday, bang, down. Okay, so remember one thing here. There was actually no reason why this came down. All the conditions are the same. The same talk is there about, about some big corporate tax adjustments and stuff like that, but we haven't seen any concrete proposals yet. So it's not like the fundamental backdrop of the economy has changed per se, to be honest with you. It's just this is happening on hope and the belief that uh, optimism, pure optimism, all right? That's what's going on. So if this can happen for no reason, there was a corrective pullback uh, before it zigzagged, it zigzagged, and then tried to go up and pretty, pretty heavy volatility, and then the breakout, then why can't it happen again this time? It could easily come down, test the 2300 level, which generally happens 80% of the time. You guys have seen it. I've shown it. When you have a trading range breakout, markets like to come and test that trading range and make sure that that breakout was real. So that 33 point drop from where we are right now, let's say 30 point drop, is good for about 180 Dow points or 200 Dow points. So just showing you some symmetries here that uh, you know things I've been doing for years. So here we stayed overbought for a bunch of days here we're staying overbought for an extra bunch of days for a better choice of words and then plop plop doesn't mean it much it simply means a reset uh and 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 letting out some hot air and taking some profits um take let's take a look at uh, uh the 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 standard deviation scenario the standard deviation from where we are right now where it broke out of but we have to measure it from where it closed at right now is um is not that extreme uh on the hourly charts uh, i'll i'll call it possibly a plus two or maybe a little bit more uh similar to what happened here it just moved away from the moving averages and like i to explain to the newbies that uh, moving averages are like you're driving on the highway you veer too much to the right veer too much to the left you come and gotta come back to your lane so that's pretty much what it is. So given that fact that uh, that the moving averages are quite similar to this pattern that we saw at the end of last month, um, we, are, we have, and you don't need to measure it with a ruler, you can just look at it visually. Um, and I'm gonna at this point hide all the trend lines. Okay, that's clean. Um, you can clearly see here that, um, that we are, um, that we're quite, you know, that we moved away from the from 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 our driving lane pretty fast. Here's the great news: we had two couple of things happen here. One, on Monday, 
not this Monday, past Monday, we had a 3450 crossover. Now, this is something that I've uh, uh, noticed uh, in many, many years. And when you have this type of crossover, uh, it is considered to be quite bullish. We had a 3450 crossover here too, with the orange line crossover. But this one seems more, uh, a more of a valid crossover just by the shape of it. Um, and, uh, and once you crossed over, and we pulled back and tested the 34 move, uh, uh, SMA again um, and kind of hugged it for a bit before we took off real fast. The fact is that the, the 34 and the 50 day moving averages are moving up nicely. That is a bullish trend. So regardless of what you hear out there, there ain't no big, bad, ugly bear market that's about to start. And you're hearing a lot of that talk out there. I put out a couple of articles by, by I think, one or two. And uh, do scan those because they're important to your, to, for your trading psychology, which is important to your trading management. Um, that uh, they're talking about this is uh, similar to what happened in 2007 and all kinds of stuff. Look, anything can happen. If any of these economic policies don't uh, come to fruition over the next month or so, the honeymoon's over. We're going to have a really nice fat pullback, something that the bears can really bite into and sit on it, okay? If a lot of the promises made to the U.S. corporate world uh, and they say, oh, we won't get any corporate tax reform done uh, till, uh, till end of the year or early next year, believe me, the markets won't like it, okay? So for, there could be a myriad of reasons why these type of things can happen. So that's where we are right now. We have a runaway uh, Bollinger up here. The lower Bollinger happens to be exactly at the 50 SMA. So do keep an eye on the on the one hour chart because that gives you an indication of where we are within the framework of, uh, of uh, uh, the markets. Let's take a look at this here. We do have a negative divergence going on and that's a given on the McClellan oscillator. The McClellan oscillator at this point, and I remember screaming, I mean not screaming, but you know, putting it out there, pointing it out in a big way, minus 400. You go minus 400 McClellan oscillator, ladies and gentlemen, you got to buy with hands down. You don't have to go crazy, but you got to buy. And the McClellan oscillator was down there. The thing is the McClellan oscillator sh shot up very nicely, but the market only made a moderate move. But this was the first indication that there was going to be a move coming. And if you notice something on a, on a mathematical basis, the, <laughs> this McClellan oscillator hit uh, below minus 400. It was 426 or something, if you remember my charts that I put out there. And, uh, and you have full access to that. Just go to the Twitter feed and go on the media and just scroll down and look at that date and you'll see it. And guess what happened? We went up 400 plus. So whatever we dropped here, as in minus 400, and I'm just rounding off the numbers, we gained back in plus 400 right there okay exact symmetry funny how these things happen so right now the McClellan oscillator are starting to decelerate on the hourly chart while the market is accelerating that's known as a negative divergence so with the negative divergence is in play and you see it happens on MACD also I'm just showing you on the on the McClellan Okay, there's a negative divergence happening because the market at new highs, market at new highs should, if, every, if one plus one is equal to, which it doesn't in the market, that's the reason why we have opportunities of arbitrage, i.e. buy low, sell high, stuff like that. Otherwise, every price would be the same and everybody would know when it's overbought, oversold. It's not like that, right? That's why we get the opportunities to take advantage of that. The McClellan oscillator should be here, should be here not sitting at 129. So that's very clear on, 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 on the thing. So you have the negative divergence here on the McClellan oscillator, and this is pure technicals, and then we have that. So let's move on. Let's take a look at, we are now hourly, let's take a look at the daily. Okay. The so daily tells us quite a bit here. The daily basically is telling us that uh, uh, this was uh, this. Let me just scroll back from. It might seem years ago, but the election was just in November, right? Just in November, right here. So if you notice what happened here, this was where we were. We were at 2086, and we are at 2330 right now on the S&P. 
So if you want to look at waves, which I showed more clearly on my other charts, you have wave, uh, this is wave one. We had a minor wave two. Then we had a wave three, you can call that kind of moving. One second. This one actually doesn't show it that well, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it. One, two, three. Then four. It's not correlating right on this particular chart. But if you scroll down my Twitter feed, you're going to see uh, uh, I, I actually showed it very clearly. Uh, and all you guys can look at it. You know, I drew it out. And let me just uh, look at my other screen. There. This one on investing.com looked a heck of a lot better. Here it comes. There you go. That's so much nicer. Okay. So here we are. This is actually from December that I did the waves. And this is much clearer since December. One, two, three, four, five. So if you look at the December wave, it went from somewhere around 2180 or so to 22, um, shot up to about 2260, I'm sorry, 2280. So 2180, it's a 100 point move, right? And then this one, the wave five, is uh, uh, was somewhere around, I would say, yeah, it was around 2260. It's 100 points, believe it or not, takes you to 2360 if you want to really measure the, the, the exact size of the wave because generally wave one is wave five. So if that's the case, then we got, you know, more stuff going on uh, uh, high, uh, higher than the 2340 level that I'm showing. We are, it's very possible that we hit 2360 by the end of February after we have a minor retracement. So let's take a look at the, uh, the daily. The daily again is showing some negative divergence uh, with the markets. Uh, the markets were here at uh, 2242, almost um, 60 points lower, right? The histogram, the McLaren oscillator histograms were at 196, showing real underlying strength. The histograms are right now at 86. Okay, uh, not above the 100 level, and we are making new highs. So if you want to look at it uh, in a very simplistic way, but the market has basically gone the other way. So that is that is also, in pure technical terms, a negative divergence. So we're starting to see all that. Now the, uh, the, the way this is validated, and you might, guys might have uh, read it or uh, seen in one of the articles that I posted, lesser number of stocks are participating in this rally, or making new highs, I should say, as we move forward. So that's the traditional way of looking at it. 40% of stocks, I think, are above, or 50% are above the 50-day moving average, which a bull will say, hey, that means other 50 can catch up to it. But the bear will say, that's not good because the market's making new highs, but lesser number of stocks are moving over their 50-day moving average. Whichever the case, we shall see. Uh, let's take a look at the, uh, uh, read the stochastics. The stochastics clearly are showing that it's still, it's, uh, it's moving higher. Um, and uh, have stayed overbought um, uh, since uh, since the since the beginning uh, beginning of February, and, uh, un and unless you see them crawl down like this on the daily, uh, there ain't no real correction along the way. And I've posted repeatedly the levels that I'm looking at, um, but so far, like that's what I said because I use many different platforms to determine. I'm not seeing any major technical weakness yet. However, technical weakness can appear in the market on its on a 200 point drop from nowhere. Um, and uh, and if Yellen says something really, like I said, that the market doesn't like, you can get these things change direction very, very quickly. So you have to be on your toes. So the best way to manage it is don't go nuts with, you know, with the, with the, with the long side trades. Take profits along the way. 
um, be selective, regenerons, uh, regenerons and stuff like that. Take some profits down, leave some runners out there. You don't need to be like all hog wild, you know, all in there uh, just because the markets are strong. Um, so uh, these levels are determined, uh, 2300, first, uh, uh, first uh, real uh, pullback. The next one would be, uh, would be right here. There's a gap. You can see that. And that gap is uh, 2280. I would call it 2284. Uh, and then you have another one here, um, that's 2267, and then we're at the bottom of this trading range, uh, which is roughly 20, 2250. So is it possible that the market over the next, um, let's say, week, um, do one of this, break down here, try to stay, you know, stays within here, and then breaks down here? Uh, and comes back within this trading range before it's bust to move again higher? Absolutely. So be prepared for volatility, period. That's done with that. Now, let me show you two other things here that's on my other screen. One is a chart that I use. I call it, it's, it's pretty much a proprietary chart. And that has to do with, um, bear with me. It's called a swing 533. For many of you who haven't been with us for too long, the 533 chart is really a terrific tool that I use to give me a sense of the swing direction in the market. It is tough to read during heavy volatility. It's excellent to read at times like this during extreme points. So let's take a look at it. So it's, it's on stock charts but you won't, won't be able to replicate this formula. I'll tell you that, okay? So when the, when, what, what generally happens is uh, instead of two months, let me do six months. Let me do the size as, I'm actually setting this up right in front of you guys. Bollinger. Pivot. Moving average, and we do update. Bingo. Now that's a little bit too messy for our eyes, so we're going to, because things have moved so fast, so there's a little bit too much action going on in the background. Let's do four months, and I think we get an idea here what's going on couple of real important things going on here. If you look at the MACD function on this, and this takes out all the noise of the one hour, four hour, 15 minutes, all that stuff, looks at, this is looking at it on a daily basis. So when you look at this thing here, there's a couple of things going on here which tells us the market has more juice to run. Number one, by tracking this for many years, um, and this was elections, by the way. Of course, we went lower after hours. But that was what was on the surface. Um, and um, so basically, uh, if you look at this here, it's climbing the upper end of, these, of this line here. That's the Bollinger Band, the blue line. So that shows real strength in the market. We, the last time we, 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 we stayed above the Bollinger uh, was back in December uh, when I showed, I showed you on the previous Think or Swim chart. Uh, we stayed over the Bollinger after overshooting over it for one, two, we had a minor correction, basically three weeks, okay? We first shot over it, and then following that, it's like a bull flag. We stayed on top of the Bollinger for three weeks. Now, this is a good way to read the tea leaves. So we are right now, we, we, are, we, oh, we have overshot the Bollinger. So here we didn't overshoot the Bollinger yet. So this is the first week, believe it or not, that we are actually above the Bollinger. So if we follow this particular uh, 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 pattern symmetry, we have one more week. You know, we, we have one more week that we stay above the Bollinger. Um, and then uh, we have two more weeks. We can stay above the Bollinger for two more weeks. That brings us basically towards the end of February. So whichever way you slice it or dice it, I mean dice it, it doesn't matter what happens out there, it looks like that they're going to end February with a sharp positive bang, unless something pretty dramatically changes, all right? 
this is unusual to have markets stay above the Bollinger or what we call Bollinger overshoots for that period of time. So it seems quite similar if you notice this, this particular movement here to what happened here. And right after that happens, you get a one big thud. Okay, and that thud came around uh, uh, this red candle, that's a 200 point move, uh, came around the 14th of December and that was the 13th of December. So, if you really think about it, today is what? Because I just realized this myself. Today is the 13th, right? Um, yeah, my chart is daily, not weekly. I know that. So, so it basically, um, today is the 13th. So, if, you, if this pattern symmetry works, then today is the 13th and the 14th, and there's always mid-month volatility. So, I do expect some pretty heavy volatility in the next 48 hours. Just, just so you guys are, you know, sure, nothing crazy, but just from uh, what I explained, the 100, 200 point type of moves. Um, so, so bottom line is that the at that point uh, there was a uh, uh, there was a nice little red candle. So if today's the 13th, today is the 13th, uh, then the 14th and the 15th, uh, you could expect to see this type of red candle appear. It seems very similar to that. However, there are certain differences, and one of the differences in this picture is that at that time, you have to mix a lot of things because, you know, it's technical analysis and trading is not one plus one equals two. I keep on saying that, but it, it, that's a fact. So the difference this time is that the MACD histograms were quite overbought here. When we were at this, uh, when we were at this level, we were almost at the top. Here we are not. It looks like it's accelerating. So we could very well have an accelerating uh, uh, MACD histogram pushing this higher um, before we have uh, one of these red candle resets. Now the thing, the other thing that uh, catches my eye, uh, very importantly, is uh, if I look at the shape of this RSI, it is definitely overbought. There's no question about it. However, it can stay overbought for another day or two, one way or the other. There's no doubt in my mind, this is the way it goes. It can stay overextended, but generally speaking, once it gets over 90, okay, you generally can linger out there a little bit more, but then you're gonna see a quick sharp move down. That sharp move down doesn't mean we have to close below the standard RSI of 30, um, where everything gets uh, uh, real cheap. It can come down in a strong bull market, it can come to 70, which is the upper end of the line, and then bounce from there or it can come to 50 halfway and then and, and then pull back up so that's i'll be watching this very carefully and this thing is dynamic in the sense that it's it i i can i can track it during the day so if this starts to curve down that means the first uh, big institutional sellers are coming in and the most important thing that gives me the indication that the market is having a trend change and the many of you heard of uh, seen this happen many many times before is when you see these lines these are the stochastic lines these are the big buy buy triggers when they cross over like that okay when the stochastic line the red one and the and 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 the uh, uh, the black one and the full stows okay uh, right there when they start to curl down when they start to do this it could be a shallow correction like we had here or it could be you know it could be a real thump like we had here, but one way or the other, you are going to see a either a one day or two day, whatever, I don't know, or a multi-day type of pullback. But so far, I see nothing. I see it just pointing higher. You can see that. They're pointing higher. And um, unless you see that trend change pointing down, that's the first sign. So this is a danger sign. Nothing that scary, but it's definitely you know telling us that it resets coming. This is positive. This is positive. So you got mixed signals here going on. Now, what I also do on this on this thing, I put the pivots and the resistances. So right now we are at R2. So that's another sign of extreme move higher. We are at R2. There is no R3. So the R1 happens to be at 2300. Possible that we come down 2200? I think that's a good possibility. The pivot is slightly below 2280 on the S&P. 
in this particular chart. And that pivot is critical because below pivot, you're going to see a rapid deceleration down towards support, and you're going to be looking at 2240. You're talking about a 100-point drop from here, and you know what a 100-point means. It means people are going to be in a state of shock. Like, oh my God, we dropped 500 points. I can't believe this happened. But these are the types of things that have to be taken into account. Okay, that's a 100-point drop to S1, support one. So that's my reading on my swing charts, and I keep a very close eye on it because the minute these stores start to turn down, um, this full stochastic starts to turn down, or I'm seeing a, 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 a deceleration uh, 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 and, and uh, uh, what do you call, and shrinkage of the MACD histograms, which certainly, again, is showing a negative divergence because we were at 2200, 100 points lower when the MACDs were at the highest level, which was around eight. And since then, they've been creeping down and finally breaking up a little bit, but that's a negative divergence. We should be sitting up here at new highs. That's just the way things goes. All right, now let's get out of here. Let's take a quick look at uh, Let's take a look at the VIX, all right? That's too close up a look. Let's look at the daily. The VIX must be feeling real lonely out there. So here's a picture of the VIX here, okay? Obviously not a very pretty picture, you know, you know all the way down here. So let's expand it. So when you expand it, you start to see things that Let's remove all the drawings. The VIX, given where the markets are, should be trading at 10. It's not. It's basically just sitting there and it's creating, believe it or not, it's creating a falling wedge. And you know what falling wedges do. Basically, this is what it's doing. That's a falling wedge. We could go lower as early as tomorrow. We can hit 10 and a half. But one with the other, this VIX, if it breaks out over 12, that means trouble. The VIX also internally has a positive divergence because it is not at, it is starting to create a higher low on the internal dynamics or the, or the dynamic momentum index. That's telling us there's some power generating within the VIX for the VIX to basically make a move higher. VIX, very simply speaking, if it closes out, if, if it moves over 12 fast, it's going to basically at that point hit 13 and possibly 14 and a half. If it hits 14 and a half, that means we got our 250 point drop in the market. That's it, it's really as simple as that. And that point is a major resistance for the VIX, major. And this is, this is also a pretty major resistance for the VIX, 13 which I've shown on my charts uh, uh, previously. So track the VIX too, if you want to keep an eye on, on, on what's going on with the markets. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, 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 uh, the overall picture on the S&P and stuff. Let's take a look at, let me just do one other thing here. This was your bull flag or bull channel, which I showed uh, uh, a few times, uh, that we broke out of on the SPX. And then we're going <coughs> to stop our discussion on the SPX before we all get too bored, but is it really important? And you can clearly see where we broke out of. So from a standpoint of whichever way you slice it or dice it, uh, we are in, you know, we're making new highs. So we are in, in uncharted territory right now. 
because we're out of the zone and uh, and 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 like I said, you have a pretty sharp standard deviation away from the moving averages and uh, a pullback towards 23.11 if you use this channel uh, chart on the daily uh, is pretty likely. 23.11 is is um, is uh, is 20 points and 20 points is again comes to the same calculation about 120 Dow points. Now saying all that as traders you got to keep in mind 120 Dow points on a sharp move down is a lot of money on the SPX puts. So you got to you got to be and and here's the key here's the trick you can't just you either have to be a little bit early or you have to react very fast when those candles start appearing. Now, if the first couple of candles that will start appearing on the shorter term basis are going to be fake outs. You're going to start to short them and, and and maybe it falls here and you're sitting around saying, okay, I want to see more of that. I mean, more of a breakdown and this and that and it doesn't come. That's why the 15 minute charts come into play in a big way because it also seems like the market is riding the coattails uh, uh, of, of, the 15, uh, of the 15 minute 34 moving average um, pretty strong. So because it's a strong market if you if you delay your trade when those candles start appearing you'll miss it unless you want to sit on it based on all the different things i've shown move uh, move into the into the 4 hour chart and then say you know what i'm going to sit on it for a couple of days because i know there's a correction coming and you could be very well be right and if you look at the 4 hour the four hour obviously takes a lot of noise out. It's very stretched. And if it falls below 80 and falls below 72, this is the way I do it. I go ahead and draw a line here, just like you do with the stock there. Okay, 71. So if this does this, and of course I'll, I'll be alerting people on that. If this does a move, If this does this, okay, and bounces, that's a dragon bullish. That means that 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 means the uh, on the upper end, it's going to just come down here, test this quickly, and make a move higher. If it breaks this level, at least for, you know this is what we're seeing tonight. If it breaks this level, then you are going to see a quick fallout down to its twenty because it'll follow this pattern symmetry, right? If it breaks below, let's say 70 or so, if it falls here, that's a lot of money on the S&P puts. That could just make your trade. I mean, the, the trade of the week, trade of the month, whatever, depending on how much money you put in. So this is this this is real tea, tea leaf reading, okay? Not just emotional. Oh, prices are down a little bit. The market's down 60 points. This is the real stuff that makes the real money for predictive traders, and that's what I try to help you guys all with with my with my alerts. So I'll be watching this very carefully. If we break below 70, 71, and we don't bounce and we fall, okay, and that fall is going to bring us down towards a real reset. That's the point. If people are still too excited, that's when the room goes nice and silent. That's the time to buy. And that means we would be testing on the upper end on the price scale, we would be testing right here, 22.90. 2290 to 23.30 is 40 points. Again, that's the 200 to 250 point drop. That would be a really fantastic reset for the markets. And it'll happen suddenly, it'll happen fast, and it's not going to give you time to react unless you react to all my alerts and stuff like that. So that's, that's, that's the best thing that I could tell you. But looking at the looking at the uh, four hour, it can stay overbought too for the next couple of days because this seems to be rising very nicely. So as you can see, there are no easy answers. There are just probabilities, and no exact certainty of what's going to happen. But the probabilities are saying that that we will move higher, maybe a little bit more before we have a quick, fast correction. And that's exactly what I see, and that's what I'm explaining. So I'll take a few questions uh, because there's really uh, not, you know, tons of stuff to sit here. I've, I've explained all the levels very, very clearly. My uh, my uh, uh, feed, uh, the the real time feed, has explained um, all the markings of where the Dow can go on extreme level. 
Uh, we have individual stocks that are doing extremely well. You just have to track them. You got to trade them. Um, and uh, but we're in a bull market, and this is what bull markets do. Um, so I'll entertain any questions if you if anyone has any question or two. Hey, hey Frank, does the TNX show anything that's? Uh, I don't. Uh, I, also I, come? I I I'll put it up there, but I don't really track the TNX because it's an ETF, and the ETFs seldom give real signals. The best way to look at a signal, uh, this is the TNX, okay, this is the daily. The TNX, the best way to uh, uh, understand what the TNX or the Russell 2000 is going to do, the really sophisticated way of doing it, is to basically look at what are the futures on the, on the actual underlying asset of the TNX. So if you look at this, this is a chart that I drew uh, a while ago. And I said this was a bull flag. Any one of you who are somewhat attentive to what the stuff that I put out there, and I know many of you are, and many of you are not, uh, know very well that I had drawn this as a as a consolidation channel, and then we had that breakout, and that breakout was this this uh, uh, line here. And this is very defined what what I'm showing you. Um, so here's your here's your move from. Um, from the, the elections, here's your consolidation channel, and here was the breakout, and that was on the 9th, which was last week. So the breakout can extend on an extreme case, and this is a daily, all the way up to 1450, because the Russell 2000 is, you know, pretty serious stuff. And I did mention that the Russell 2000 would be the biggest beneficiaries of any type of protectionist policy, trade policy, because, uh, you know, they're, they're, most of their business is in the U.S. So they're not held hostage to international fluctuations. So in coming to the TNX, I'd rather be tracking this uh, um, uh, to get an idea on the TNX. And if one wants to look at the TNX, they can look at this. Uh, um, this doesn't tell me anything. If I look at the one-hour chart here, uh, the TNX is also quite bullish because this is a um, this is you, it, it's it's a uh, V-shaped move. This was the consolidation channel that I just showed on the TF, which is the futures. And this is where we are right now. There are multiple gaps. There is a gap up here on your, T on your TNX. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I thinking? I'm thinking TNA. My apologies. Somebody should have corrected me while I'm doing this. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. was talking about the 10-year bond. Yeah, yeah, bar. the 10-year bond. My apologies because I'm like, I'm, in my head, I heard TNA because you had asked me that last week. So I'm thinking to myself, uh, you know, I'm talking about the TNA, which is basically the Russell 2000 uh, ETF. Okay, so the 10-year bond is very clear. Um, uh, uh, sorry about that. So what happens when these things are uh, uh, have similar uh, symbols? So let's do this. So we are about to cross a pretty major, uh, uh, at least on the hourly chart, as you can clearly see here, the uh, uh, major downtrend line, which uh, it's been rejected off since it hit two and a half. So if it breaks out over this, uh, then you're looking at, uh, then you're looking here. You're basically going to two and a half. Remember, for people who don't understand the TNX, this is the, this is the core 10-year uh, uh, treasury yield. And the way you read it, it's not 25. We're not at 25%. You just move the decimal to the left. So it's 2.5%. So 25.55 is 2.5%, 2.55%. And um, this is the yield. So just keep in mind, as yields go higher, we know that by now, it's favorable to financials. And as yields go higher, bond prices fall. That means money coming out of the bond market into the stock market. So that's is 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 money from safe haven which is basically the 10 year government bond uh, and the other government bonds of course uh and into the into the risk market which is basically risk assets of stocks so bottom line is that if we break out over here uh then we should be coming back towards this level uh that we saw uh last uh when was it at two and a half it was two and a half at the end of february so we could this pattern is very it's it's it's, it's very symmetrical as you can see so the first point of engagement is two and a half percent. We could get that by Wednesday if if uh, Jan Yellen uh, uh, implies that uh, Yellen implies that uh, she's uh, she's pretty serious about the hawkish about raising rates faster sooner than uh, later uh, continue starting you know moving into the March rate hike. 
So th this will jump pretty fast and it looks like it wants to. It looks like it wants to. So this would be good for financials. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Goldman uh, breach the 251, 252 level. Uh, so that would be a great stock to play. And as you can clearly see, um, it had a fantastic strength in, since it hit the tactical lows just the other day at 237 and uh, or slightly lower when I you know, basically you know, called it a buy. Um, looking at the, the TNX on a daily, um, it's, it's, it's a tougher read. Um, because uh, the highest that we got to uh, was at the end of December, 2.65%. If you look at it weekly, uh, it's clearly telling you that rates are moving higher, period. I, I don't know anything here that's telling us it's not. It might be a little bit slower than we think, but uh, bear with me one second. Remember, rates were 5.3%. Uh, back in uh, 07, okay, to, and then we went as low as 1.3%. So that was when, you know, all the mortgage rates and stuff were, you know, in, in the gutter. Um, so this is certainly a bullish chart, in my opinion, and I think we're moving up towards the 3% range. If we move up very fast like this, like a, like a, like a sharp move up in two or three days, the markets are going to get unnerved. More than that, there's a technical reason. When bond, bond yields shoot up this very quickly, like it did here, okay, uh, in April, uh, like it did here uh, uh, in July, what happens is uh, of last year, this was April of 2015, you get the rate tantrum and that means that bond bond deals shoot up that fast bond prices collapse large institutions because remember the bond market is 10 times the size of the stock market all right or something like that it's huge uh we are a 20 trillion dollar market you're talking 200 uh, uh something like that or uh, maybe i'm exaggerating i don't have the exact number in my head but it is at least five to ten times larger than the stock market the bottom line is you get margin calls because prices collapse and they're going to come up with the money to support the bond holdings. So you don't want a sharp spike up. You want a moderate, gradual move higher uh, and that the market can sustain. If you get a sharp spike up, you're going to get jitters. Stocks are going to fall too. And there will be a rate tantrum because all of a sudden they'll be like, oh, good Lord. Yellen went from being a dove of not raising rates. Now she wants to raise rates every five, you know, every, every month. So that's the story. All right. Any other quick questions, please? I'm sure somebody has a question on a stock or something I can answer. Anyone? Okay. So oh, that hey, 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 Frank, I'll ask one more. If sure, sure. How about, I, I, how about IBB and then that's it? Yes, yeah, sure. Now, you do know uh, I put a fantastic chart of the IBB t uh, today. You got a chance to see that too, Corey? I, yeah. I didn't get to see it. Okay, it's on the Twitter feed. I suggest you see it. Okay, it's very, very well drawn, and it's drawn on the, it's drawn on the quad platform. So it's 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 very precise. So uh, look that up. It was done in the afternoon. All right. So uh, please uh, check it out. So let's take a look of the IBB, which we normally don't on a weekly basis, uh, and draw a couple of things here um, from. Uh, Kind of a messy chart, but this is the best that I can show. So the IBB on the up upper end on your um, one second here, Corey. Bingo. So the 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 biotech index, uh, you're looking at 320 on the on the mid channel. And the upper channel, you're looking at 367. 367 means that the the, the pretty much all the major stocks that we follow on the biotech are going to be up another 40 percent or more okay regeneron will be at 400 dollars i mean not 400 it'll be at 500 dollars uh allergan is going to be at uh, 350 um giving examples of you know if, if we get up towards the upper end of this move uh you know stock like uh, clovis will be at 80 uh stuff like that so um 
a real premium expansion, right? Um, um, uh, the, the multiple expansion. So saying all that, let's draw a drown trend line here on the on the weekly chart here. So this would be a clean downtrend line, uh, uh, line to draw. And as you can clearly see, we have just barely broken out over the downtrend line. That, in my opinion, gives more room for the upside. So the IBB is in good shape looking at the weekly chart that we are seeing here because the downtrend line just got broken on the 30th of January, right there, with this, uh, with this uh, uh, powerful one second with this powerful uh, engulfing candle right there right there this one now we would like to see one of this to be honest with you but look at this one it was a false move you know it hit really hard uh, back in uh, November and then it gave all of it back and that's the nature of the beast biotechs are very 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 politically sensitive with the comments coming out um, first it was Clinton then Trump said a couple of things, and then Sanders said whatever. But those people don't matter anymore. It's what comes out from Trump now, and and uh, his health secretary Tom Price, uh, who is actually very favorable to the biotech industry. Um, so it, it should be positive. So this is what we see here. The 320 level uh, would be fantastic to take out. And if there is true pattern symmetry, and it takes time, uh, then we basically moved around this channel for months for a year and once we break out of that uh, it should be fa a faster move from 320 to 360 uh, based on this uh, based on the pattern symmetry of what happened back in 2016 you'll find you know it's pretty amazing how these things work remember there was a big big drop when it fell into this channel so once it crosses here expect a couple of big fat weeks to take it up towards this level here and that would be very, very positive, and you know, and you see, starting to see that happen in a bunch of stock, including Allergan, uh, and uh, so that's so that's where we are now. Let's take a quick look on on the same biotech index on the daily, and we will see a little bit more noise. In fact, quite a bit more noise. And uh, the way you do it is you highlight from here, take out these lines take out all lines actually and you can start to see that we are starting to create a very powerful um, triangle bear with me which I uh, which we again broke out of on the ninth which was last week okay so this is good. From, the, from a daily perspective, we have now broken out of this triangle, consolidation, diagonal, whatever you call it, and this is positive. The next level of contact would be the simple lines here. Is We are resting on it right now. Upper level of contact is 294 and then 300. So in my opinion, we have a good shot to get to the 300 level uh, before we pause and that's been a heavy heavy resistance for a while right we know that so we need to take that out and once we take that out then you have the 320 and that's what we're shooting for so that's your biotechs overall it's it, i i consider that to be positive from what i can see here but of course we know volatility on this stuff uh, last time we got up here and it was looking damn good uh which was back on uh, uh january look what happened but that was, you know, all the all the talk about drug price control and stuff like that. I think a lot of it has been kind of like the market's gotten immune to it. So I think this time the breakout uh, is a higher probability than what we encountered back in the in the beginning of uh, thing. Can I go over Tesla? Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Um, now, Xita, keep in mind that I have some uh, a lot of charts on Tesla, right? Uh, that that are out there. Tesla is 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 going to three hundred dollars. In my opinion, okay, it's his stock is is full of power, and from what I understand, it's still 23 or 27 percent shorted. I mean, Lord help us, okay. And uh, it, because with that type of short from the chainuses of the world, that's that big short seller, and many other people who are just committed Tesla haters. Um, I, I gotta say, it's just it's just crazy. So let's take a, a, this stock could for no reason. For no reason. In fact, there's been no news on Tesla aside from the fact that they are going to uh, bring out the Model Three uh, to start producing in October. You know, uh, the old days, which means just a few months ago, uh, 
if there was news that the workers were unionizing, uh, UAW was uh, recruiting workers uh, uh, to unionize, unionize them. I can never say that word. Uh, you would have Tesla drop 20 points in two minutes. It didn't even bother. It dropped how many points? Like two. We played a scalp. That's all we could do. Um, so one second here. Tesla, has, we have to look at it on a monthly at this point. And thanks for bringing it up. So when you look at the monthly chart, uh, you see what the heck is going on here. Uh, so here we are. It is within kissing distance of that 10 point move at 291. Once it hits 291, you're going to see a slew of these hardcore committed fanatical, uh, in my opinion, extremist shorts, using a political term, radical shorts, okay, uh, of Tesla, uh, try to short it again, just because it went to 290. They're going to get demolished again. Now, that's just my feeling. I'm not a Tesla lover or anything. I'm just seeing the power of the stock. When you see movements like this, the last time we saw movements like this, similar but smaller, was here. It got close to 290. It went to 287. This time, it's candle after candle. I mean, this is a lot of money going in. So my hunch is that that's your trading band right there, okay? For swing traders, people who are not looking at daily movements and stuff like that. Um, this is surging forward, so that's a plus. It's surging forward. It does not get severe overbought till 99 on the uh, on the on the DMI or dynamic moment index. It's only at 86. I shouldn't say only, but it's at 86. Um, bottom line is use your trading band. And this will be not my, my long term projection on Tesla. Overall, I've been very correct on it. Here's 291, here's 177. Okay? So that's uh, that's uh, roughly what? 100 and. 100, let's, if this is 130 points, right? 170, uh, 178, 178 minus 290 to be exact is 112 points, right? If this is broken out with another massive breath thrust, one of those huge bullish candle breakouts, which will pull back and all that kind of stuff, but it stays above this range, you can add, you can basically add uh, 112 points and that's a that's a monthly chart so it'll take a little time but in Tesla's case God help us you know if this really goes it goes so it might not take six months it might take two months uh, so if you add 300 112 you're arriving at a stock which is going to be at four hundred dollars period in fact sometimes I scratch my hands and why the heck do I work so hard to trade all this other stuff when I could just trade the heck out of Tesla and just sit on it. I mean, really, when you think about it, I mean, over even on a short-term basis, you know? So that's why we're humans. That's why we're all idiots. Sometimes you just need three stocks and just that's it and play some indices. Why the heck are we looking around for things when we have the strongest stocks in the market in front of our face just going loose, going bonkers? It's actually not kind of crazy, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay, because it's it's crazy because from a, somebody who doesn't quite un, uh, uh, is kind of new to the market like you are, um, a stock price movement is not necessarily crazy, because there's people who'll be out there say, oh, they don't make any money, blah 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 blah. You know what? I gave that up a long time ago. Amazon never made money either when the stock was at 200, and then one day they turned the spigots on and showed how much they made from AWS, which is Amazon Web Services which Bill Miller and all these fantastic fund managers knew from day one. And most people said, AWS, what the heck is that? Is that a new thing they're selling on their site? It's their frigging business, Amazon Web Services. The reason Amazon fell after earnings, because their web services numbers did not hit the whisper number of their high range. It's expanding very fast. So can somebody tell me what Tesla's real business is? Remember, Amazon loses money on everything they sell to us. That's why we love Amazon, because it's reasonably cheap. Tesla loses money on every car that they sell. What are they? What is their real gold mine? Can somebody tell me what it is? Come on, somebody tell me. Nobody knows. 
Is it batteries? Yes, batteries. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Corey. Batteries. Just read up on Tesla one day. The stuff that they're doing with batteries, it's not just for cars. That's a joke. Our neighbors have a bunch of Teslas. And they actually put a charging station down in the, in, in, in the thing. That the condo board put it down. It's a great. You know, it costs a lot of money. Batteries, but batteries for industrial purposes. Batteries for home automate residential automation but industrial automation imagine a whole factory running on tesla batteries like their gigafactory does guys it's huge or is this a huge it's hugely bigly okay seriously and yes we're sitting here scratching like oh how many cars did they sell like who cares i'd never buy a tesla even if you paid me so there's a lot of stuff going on out there. What's the other venture that's a big money-making venture? That is just starting on the early stages, not of development, early stages of bringing in serious money for Tesla. Come on, guys. You guys are smart so, people. Solar panels? Solar panels is one. Solar thing is kind of built in with the batteries. Yeah. But they, I don't think they're going to make real money on the solar uh, you know, think the solar is going to be incorporated in their battery systems too. You know, natural powered stuff. What is their other business? And you guys know the answer, so just answer me. Think and answer. What is their other business, which is just about to just explode in the next coming years? Is it the tube? Come on, guys, SpaceX. You know, sometimes I feel like I, I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of aliens here. Seriously. You know, let it deport all of you guys out there to Mars or somewhere. Just kidding. SpaceX, okay? SpaceX is a huge venture. Their rockets, you know, SpaceX taking taking payloads out to uh, to space stations and not building colonies necessarily on Mars, which he wants to do. But SpaceX is huge. SpaceX is like industrial. It's like Navistar. It's carrying huge payloads to space, satellites to space. And as more and more space stations go out there, you know, going out there, you know, round trip, they are the, they're doing what the shuttle did with difficulty. They're doing it with these rockets. They're putting stuff out there. And, and Iridium, which is the world's largest satellite system, okay, for everything, is, 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 Sp is SpaceX's largest customer. So you've got different angles of business. That's what I'm getting at. So when somebody comes over and tells me, and believe me, I don't even bother analyzing Tesla's numbers. But I'm not that smart as some of the people. I really am not, okay? And I've seen more balance sheets and income statements than most of you put together and analyst reports. So that's it. I'm looking at it purely from this here. Tesla, if it breaks out over this, it's over. Over. There are shorts from 290, uh, and, and there's a lot of these uh, 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 hardcore dogmatic shorts who I've, I've mentioned in one of my video casts who are basically liars. They say, oh, I'm shorted at 290. Okay, and so you didn't cover the stock, and I, and I know I mentioned this, you know, at 170, 180. Oh, no, no, because I know it's going to go lower. Okay, great. So the stock goes up to 290. You mean you held on, gave back all your profits? Yes, yes, because I know the stock's going to go lower. All a bunch of crooked liars. Most traders are liars, just so you know that. Okay, so the bottom line is that, and then it drops down here. Fall, it, look how methodical it is. So they're, they're getting blasted. Now, there are some institutional shorts like Chanos who have a threshold of pain much bigger because they have a lot more money. So they could be short at 290 and trading the game. Okay? Why do you think Tesla's moving like this? Because Chanos and his buddies who are hardcore committed shorts, and they have their research to prove it. Yeah, who am I, a, a puny more so, uh, in a, a, what do you call a trader from nowhere, you know, arguing with these, you know, huge fund managers who are short Tesla. But remember one thing here. Once it crosses over here, they are going to start calling in and ordering adult diapers from Amazon. I'm telling you that right now. That itself will jettison at 50 points. So that's pretty much what's happening right now. Short covering is rampant. And I'm sure there are major funds who are also buying the stock on the heels of the hardcore uh, institutional shorts getting squeezed. This is a very, very powerful stock. 
and and this is uh, uh, believe it or not and thanks for asking that um exeda um thanks reed i knew you'd come up with that the reed said spacex uh so um uh, for asking this question is because uh, this is um and again, there will be huge volatility because you're seeing these candles. This is a uh, this is a, a December, January, February. Didn't we have like big, big fat pullbacks on Tesla during that time? Sure, we did. But when you smooth it out and look at the monthly and keep an eye on the bigger picture, this is what you see. And it's a great question. Thank you, Xena. So, um, so bottom line is that it could very well get to the top and pull one, of, you know, and do and do this. Because that's what it's been doing since 2014. This was 2014 when it entered this tight trading band. Once it broke out of here, remember it's a $50 stock back in 2013. So, is it possible that it does this? Absolutely. So you actually know what the trading range is um, on the stock. If it breaks out, that's what I'm saying. It'll do a quick 50-point move, real fast. Now. This is the last thing I'll say. Generally speaking, law of physics, you keep on hitting a surface. I know I've heard some, many of you have heard me say this before. Whether on the downside, whether on the upside, it starts to get weaker. Here it pumped one, two, three, slipped a little bit more, four. Four times it hit this lower end of the range, the 180, 190 level. Uh, here, I think it went, went to below 150. Anyway, it held. That means this is the floor for now. So here, you go one, two, and here's the third attempt. On the third attempt, it's possible because there's so much money flowing into it right now. So can you remember, and Tesla, uh, Elon Musk now is 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 right on the uh, uh, Technology Advisory Council, right sitting next to Mr. You know, sitting next to the Donald. He's on first name basis with the Donald. If you notice, Donald hasn't pissed on green energy, despite a lot of climate change skeptics and all that stuff. Right? You notice that? Exactly. He hasn't come out and said, ah, don't, you know, screw those, excuse my friend, sorry. You know, uh, hell with the, with the battery powered cars and all that stuff. He hasn't said one bit. He's appointed Elon Musk, who's a very sharp guy, to sit on his uh, technology advisory council. There's a lot of other factors going on aside from, you know, what's happening within the company. So that's a pretty big thing. So if it breaks out, just watch out. So look at the monthly, look at the weekly, but expect real volatility. Just because it drops 14 points, if it doesn't change the picture on the monthly uh, frame as I'm showing you, that means it's going higher. Okay. Um, that's it. All right. Guys, thank you for attending. Um, let's keep an eye on things. I'm there with you guys uh, 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 putting in some phenomenal trades. Thank you for all the referrals to everyone who, uh, who, who who's come in recently. Um, and like I said, I would love to see a nice fat pullback. And you know what? Who cares what I like? It's what the market wants to do. So that's really where I come in. I, and, and in the meantime, just, you know, just stay a little bit steady because we're going to hit some, you know, we're going to hit some uh, uh, sort of rocky patch. I don't think it's going to be that rocky. But keep in mind, the biggest risk to this market is the political slash economic risk. In other words, not delivering the goods that have been promised. That is the biggest risk. Aside from that, things are pretty okay internationally as well as here. All right. That's it for now. Uh, I'll put this up on the on on the YouTube uh, Clueless Aid YouTube channel. See you guys tomorrow. Thank you for listening.